name is Deb Zion, and I work with the Ocean Health Index um, on the whole project. Um, I want to introduce the folks who came over from Conservation International. I asked them to come today because we're looking forward to some conversations as well as me giving, having a chance to kind of show what we're doing to you. Um, and I wondered if we could actually just go around the room real quickly and introduce everybody so we all know who, who we are. Hi, how are you? My name is Tina Lee. Um, I am the Ocean Health Index Coordinator, so I work very closely with them. Hi, I'm Ginny Farmer. I work with our Seascapes program, the Pacific Ocean State program, supporting our, our teams in the field. And my name is Sebastian Drake. I'm the Vice President for Marine Conservation and uh, Conservation International. Uh, and obviously, through a number of our programs, we're collaborating with RARE uh, in the Seascapes and hopefully on this Ocean Fund Index effort. And I'm Brian Day, and I'm the Director of Social Marketing here at RARE. Yeah, I'm Duncan MacDonald, Operations Assistant. I'm Julie McCord, Director of Communications. I'm Tom Gerhardt. I'm the newly appointed uh, regional training director for the uh, Pride English program. I'm Andrea Dersik, and I'm a uh, program development associate. I'm Kate Manel. I'm the program development manager. And then Rodrigo just went to rally some more troops, um, and he is core development uh, manager for Latin America. Wonderful. That's great. <laughs> well, today we're here to talk, and I would encourage everybody to jump in and ask questions anytime you want to because it's very informal and, and uh, should be interactive and fun. Uh, to, but to talk about Ocean Health Index. Um, the Ocean Health Index is a project that started about three years ago. And it came out of some conversations about the fact that there was a lot of research starting to take place around the oceans. It has, there's been some research for decades, but it's still stunning to me how little actually we do know. Um, but we were starting to realize that there were databases of information all over the world, kind of in silos, sitting separately in different places. And a group of people kind of came together and said, you know, it's, it's time to, to try and pull that together into some kind of common language that we can all use. And as we got to thinking about it, um, it really started to be expressed as a series of questions about how humans use the oceans and how the oceans, uh, how necessary they are to our lives. And that introduces what I'll show you, which kind of illustrates the questions we started asking ourselves. set out to devise a concept about 
about oceans to measure the health, not without human beings, but with human beings included in the equation. So the question, the definition we gave to the ocean health is basically to say, ocean health is a, is a, a healthy ocean is an ocean that has the ecological function that can support the services and the benefits that humans need in an ongoing way, in a way that's self-sustaining. The most thriving, healthy ocean obviously offers the most products and, and, and food that we need as human beings. And for it to be thriving and healthy, we have to do certain things in order to manage, it, manage it. So it's a balancing act. And that's fundamentally the underlying unique structure of the Ocean Health Index. Um, we also said that there are certain key things. First of all, that this needed to be put together by a group of scientists from many, many, many different fields all over the world. And secondly, that in order to be a successful venture, we had to have certain things be true. One, it had to be standardized. There had to be a real way to measure it. So we use only global measurements in a particular version of the Ocean Health Index we've just done. Secondly, it needs to be quantitative. We were really looking to start talking about language that we could share just the way we talk about currency and dollars. We get for dollars a sense of how big an economic impact or something we do is. In the case of the Ocean Health Index, we wanted to be able to give a number gave you a sense of what the impact of some, some action or behavior would be. Set, thirdly, that it's transparent, that you can see all the data and everything that went into it, as well as the methodology. And finally, that it's scalable, that it's something that you could apply to the bay or to the full ocean on a global basis, and that it could go up and down that scale easily and be used by a lot of people on different spectrums. Um, it was taken, categorized into 10 different goals um, that we defined as being critical. Oops, sorry, I flipped that. I know I did that. Flip that too quickly. Bear with me. Go back a little. Bit. And the ten goals are fundamentally um, definitions of what the we need from our oceans. And so we talk about food provision, seafood provision, artisanal fishing opportunities, which we separate out only because we're talking about the opportunity to do artisanal fishing. Um, natural products, carbon storage, shoreline protection, sense of place, this is the places that matter to us, either spiritually or for some particular species that lives there, tourism and recreation, livelihoods, jobs, wages, um, clean waters, and biodiversity. And that's how we have categorized the way that we're looking at the ocean. Each one of those categories ends up getting a score. So for instance, in the category of livelihoods, Underneath that category, the way we came up with the goal is by taking a whole suite of global data bases. And this is all data that existed from other entities. And chose the best ones that we could, and it was a difficult task um, for the scientists to do, that most um, clearly fed into that goal and gave us good quantitative information that was on a global basis. So that when you were comparing one Ocean Health Index score of one country to another, you were working on the same basis. I'm just going to take a half a second to stop here because this is for the Global Ocean Health Index, which we're about to publish. But what I said to you about scale was really critical. The concept behind the Global Index, the Ocean Health Index, is that it can be used on many different scales. So on down the road, this list that you see up here will have local versions of what you would put into it. And your local version depends on what data you have and what's essential to that goal in terms of your area. So the idea is not a one-size-fits-all concept for the Ocean Health Index. For the global version, yes, we need to use common global data for it. But if you want to go and measure the San Francisco Bay or the Chesapeake Bay or, or a bay in, in Africa, you want to use the data that is the most relevant to that particular bay, the most accurate, and feeds into that goal most, most um, appropriately for what you care about. And it's made to be flexible in that way so that we can come out with material and information that isn't just useful in a library, that isn't useful in actually figuring out what, the, um, what we need to do and how to change the scores that we want to change. Uh, the science team was headed up uh, at UC Santa Barbara at the NC Center under um, Ben Halpern, who had wrote uh, the 2008 paper on the impact of humans on the ocean. Uh, we have the sea around us from the University of British Columbia, who are a major contributor to this, uh, as well as other organizations like uh, Woods Hole, Scripps, uh, really a large variety of organizations that participated and produced what is
is a 17-page paper and has 125 pages of backup and still isn't sufficient. We still have secondary and third area, tertiary papers coming out of it. So uh, it, it will be a piece of work that goes on for a long, long time. I knew that you would want to see this because it's so essential. Uh, it's the, <laughs> it's the uh, equation, and I thought you should jot it down so you could check my figures later on. But fundamentally what we're trying to do is we've uh, tried to take uh, each one of the goals, and we basically talk about what's the trend in the last five years or so of that particular set of data, what's the current status in terms of that piece of data, and then what are the things that are working against it, that we know that we're going to be facing in the future, more crowding, more use of it, heavier fishing, and what are the things that are going to be positive, resilient, and those would be marine protected areas in place, good management, that kind of thing. So that when you put it all together, you have not only a sign of where we are right now, taking into account what the trend's been, what the current data is, but also some indication of what the future trend's going to look like based on what those pressures are and what those resilience factors are. So in the numerator of this particular equation, you take all of that data and you put together, put it together in terms of what currently is and, and that score. And then underneath it, what you have is basically based on reference points that were selected for each one of the goals, what the best possible status we could be in would be. And choosing those reference points was fascinating work for this team. They had really come to grips with reference points that would be equal to 100 on our scaling system. And fundamentally, you would be saying, if we attained that, that would be a major achievement that would mean that you are producing as much as you can from the oceans in a way that's sustainable. But we had to make it realistic and, tr and applicable. So we used a lot of different ways of coming at the reference points um, in order to say, hey, this isn't just some high in the sky idea. This is something that's specific to this goal, that's realistic, that we really think we can achieve, but would be a major step forward if everyone were in that same place. So it is a, basically a, a numerator denominator, and you come out with some portion of 100 points for each one of the goals. So there is a global score. I actually know it, and I can't share it with you. We put a false figure in here. Um, if I could share it with you, I'd ask you to guess what you would think it might be, just out of curiosity, because I'm not going to tell you today, but what do you think it might be? <laughs> Ballparks. Out of 100? Yeah. 38. Pessimist over here. <laughs> I was going to say 40. But... Yeah. Okay, but that's, yeah. I, I guessed 57, um, other people I've heard. I've never heard, I think, anybody go over 65. I don't think so. It's sort of a general feeling that we're kind of falls. Um, the other part of this whole thing is the communications plan. What's interesting about this, this is one of the few science projects that we've ever talked, science projects that we've ever talked about, where the communications was very much a, a huge factor in whole process. And that's because we knew that in order to do the Ocean Health Index properly, you had to get it in use. So our measurement of success for the Ocean Health Index is that people are actually using it in a day-to-day -day way to make policy, to make decisions, whether they're small places or large places, that it's a functioning, useful tool. And so to do it, we created quite an elaborate um, communications plan. We created a mission statement, um, which, as you all know, is always difficult because you have to live with it for the rest of your life. <laughs> but the fundamentals of it is that it's a new standard of measurement that we use, uh, that it will become part of everyday use in terms of um, making decisions that are beneficial for the oceans, that we want policymakers and scientists to be able to use it easily and with facility and have confidence in it. We also um, are aiming not only at policymakers, but we understand the importance of business and the importance of the public. Business because they drive so much of how we get things done. The public because the pressure to change things and make things change, it comes from the public. Uh, I'm impressed by the fact that we're making so much motion happen nowadays with businesses and, um, and doing things through more sustainable practices. But when you talk to people about that, the reason they give you is that our public, the public's no longer going to accept it if it's not like that. 
So driving this thing through the public is an essential big piece. We had four audiences, uh, policymakers, scientists, business, public, and then the subset of those audiences. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. In fact, I'm going to kind of flip through because I want to talk to you more. We did rather an elaborate plan for communications. We had a visual expedition that went out and got us assets in terms of photos and video. We are part of the Blue Ocean Film Festival. And we, we are sponsoring Blue Ocean Film Festival shows all over the world, including one that we're going to do coming up very soon in China. We're going to go to 20 universities with it. We have uh, selected 14 countries where we're putting special effort in uh, to reach the community and the policymakers. And when we launch, we have Edelman International Press tied in with us, as well as a, a rather massive uh, website. We uh, are under consideration by nature and hope to be published soon. Please cross your fingers on our behalf. Uh, the 14 country outreach is aimed at these countries. I list them only so that you can kind of take a look and see the places you work in common with us. Um, these were selected largely because Conservation International uh, has offices where we know they can really make something happen in the country. Um, in China in particular, we're having some success. The State Ocean Agency is very interested in the index and has requ requested that we come up with some ideas on how we could do a regional ocean health index there. Um, similarly, we're doing the Blue Film Festival, as I mentioned, and they have a lot of plans tied into that, so we're really excited about their reception of this. On down the road, we will be doing regionals, and I want to talk about this a little bit. We ourselves are going to produce four regionals coming up very soon. One in Brazil to tie in with Rio Plus 20. One in, the, for, in July for the U.S. Congress, so it's the United States on both coasts. And one in Fiji for the Pacific Leadership Forum. But the idea behind that is we are coming up with a, an index that's more local, that really uses their data, not global data, and can be more specific for them to be able to use it and really get a grip on what's going on and how to make the changes they want to affect. On down the line, we won't be producing those. We, would, we are hoping to produce a tool so we can literally hand the Ocean Health Index over to anyone who wants to use it, that they can feed their own information into it with guidance from, from us, but that it becomes a tool that you really can get the, the index for your particular area that you're interested out and you can track it year after year after year without it being a big hoop do so that it becomes very much part of daily living uh, and something we refer to on a regular basis. Uh, similarly, we are doing a half hour special and a series of news stories that are going out in syndication to local TV stations in the country. Um, this is a way of creating public awareness and also of continuing awareness of it throughout the year, so it's not just a once a year announcement of Edelman PR is helping us with a big PR effort. Uh, syndication I already mentioned, I won't spend too much time on that. So we have the launch, the publication, the global PR, the 14 country PR, and the syndication. And then underneath all of that is a website. And we have kind of created an extremely comprehensive website. This is the first few pages of it that talks about the Ocean Health Index, explains it in, in depth, and then takes you into each one of the goals in depth, takes you into each one of the components in depth, and takes you into each one of the countries so that you literally can look up your country's scores on each one, and has stories from those countries. This is an illustration. Wonder what the world's oceans looked like 50 years ago? This is it. Costa Rica's Cocos Island National Park. Though seaweed grows quickly, a healthy harvest takes careful planning. Seaweed needs to be planted near the open ocean, at a spot where strong currents and tides provide fresh nutrients and good water exchange. It's the best way to prevent disease in the harvest. The Pot and I almost found an ideal location. Oysters are filter feeders, which means they remove tiny plankton, algae, and other small particles from the water as they siphon it through their gill system. 
the oysters help clears it up and filter, filters the water and makes the water more pure. I don't know if you ever read the book from by John Smith when he first came here of so many oysters in Chesapeake Bay. You can look down 25 feet, 20, 25 feet and see the bottom. It really kept the bay clear. And these oysters here do the same thing now that they do then, but it's just not enough oysters now to do what it did then. that you targeted, when you launch there, who's going to be the, I guess, the implementers of, the, of that? You know, it's not so much implementation, it's, we have asked our people who are there from Conservation International to be sure that the people that they work with most often are familiar with it and don't get surprised because when it comes out, it's likely that it'll be carried in the newspaper or carried as a story or discussed. And we don't want any of our, uh, any of the stakeholders who are involved with us to get surprised and then as they get acquainted with it to take it in and say is this a tool that we could use in some places so it's much more a, a gradual process but we wanted to be sure that the first first thing we did didn't turn into a negative thing and it remained a positive thing um, but we one of the reasons we're here talking to you all is we need um, all of us kind of to join hands to carry this into uh, policy making 
the day-to-day -day process within programs uh, of utilizing this kind of a tool and making it part of the fabric of, of moving forward. So that's the real goal of it. Thank you for coming. It's good to see you again. Um, I have a question. If you were a programmatic staff person, like two things, like how would you actually get the information at like a site level? And then two, if you did have information at a site level, uh, what would be the process or protocols for sharing that information? Well, we're hope <laughs> let me take it backwards and do the protocol first and then go to the data. Um, what we're hoping is that within six months from now, we will have a tool that you literally can use, that, that we will have somebody on staff who will basically send you the software for the tool and will guide you through the usage process. Um, so that in that way, then you become, it becomes truly accessible to everybody. Um, right now, if you want to do it, uh, you have to actually come through the uh, University of Santa Barbara and work with them hand in hand. The data uh, is another issue entirely. The data has to come from that location. Um, nothing about the Ocean Health Index is going to create data. So it's really, it has to be that you, you find the data from the various resources that you can on a local basis. And in some cases, where we can't be helpful is if the data doesn't exist, and sometimes we've had this on a global level, of course, then you can try and figure out what are the proxies that we can figure out that would fit in there that would give us the best sense of it possible. And sometimes those proxies are not as great as you'd like them to be. But perhaps also to clarify that the first iteration we only have a global score and then a score at the, at the country level. So that's a resolution that you would be able to access through the website. The finer scale, so you have to go about the way that that depth question. But if you get down to the bay level or, or a smaller level like that, then, then you are dependent on your own resources for finding specific data. So then we would like map out our local resources against how that compares to like a regional yeah. Okay. And, and one potential, I mean, given that a lot of the work that we're doing focuses on the turf reserves, um, <clears throat> and obviously the food provision being one of the important components of that, the Ocean Health Index will uh, allow you to uh, look at food provision in the context of all the other benefits the oceans provide, and for any specific country, uh, look at you know how well food provision score compared to the other goals. And so if uh, Food provision were to score lower than the others, it might be useful in your messaging in terms of saying, look, the ocean provides all these benefits. In country X where we're working, we have a really low score for food provision. That's why our solution, the, the turf reserves, are particularly relevant in, in addressing uh, uh, you know, a high priority issue. But, but it won't help you analyze trade offs between investments in ecosystem services well, will just tool. tell you one state of art today how it is but not necessarily how it's going to be in the future and depending on how you're going to manage your yeah it does that you know, <coughs> what you can do excuse me for problem here. Um, what you can do is when the, when the tool exists if you feed in data that says if I do this what does it look like across the, the spectrum of the goals right how has that so if I were to put an MPA into place and it were to cause this this and this fundamentally to happen. It then puts that data in and you can see it reach out among all the goals and you can see how you've impacted it. And that starts to give you some sense of, of trade-offs. Um, I mean, if you, if you decide not to go, for instance, into um, aquaculture, which is part of the fish and seafood provisions, because you choose not to, you, you don't want to use your water space doing aquaculture, you can see that that score in, in food will remain low because you're not maximizing your productivity, but other scores may go up because you are not causing you know, detritus in the water, you're not ruining some of the habitats, that kind of thing. And so you can get a sense of how that goes. It's made for that. It's really that's the intention of it. And then, yeah, the model is such that certain data layers interact with multiple goals uh, in positive and negative ways. And so it's, it's done in a way that recognizes the trade-offs for instance, habitats is a good one. Um, the various habitats, whether it's salt ponds or mangroves or uh, coral reefs, is actually an element of four or five of the goals, among other things. So if you decide to get rid of a, a mangrove uh, forest because you want to do aquaculture or shrimp, you may get some improvement in 
providing food, or not, it won't go way up because it's not necessarily sustainable. But coming over here, you'll see your, those numbers all go down because you've lost that mangrove resource, and so to bring those up, not other numbers down quite significantly. So you'll be able to input uh, dollar values as well to, to the matrix to show the trade of and at the end. Okay, this is my order. I mean, I, mean, I think it's like an invest tool. Or not that quite this how that you can eventually use. It doesn't explicitly look at the economic cost per se, but if you took the once we have the tool, um, if you actually looked at what the cost of interventions were and what you thought the, the results would be, I guess you could kind of monetize it. Right. But it's, it's not meant it's it's not meant to work in the same way as. Well, one key place where it gets into monetary though is in. Um, Living, uh, making a living. We have wages and we have um, revenues. And so that one goal is impacted when you do some of the other things. If it's creating jobs, if it's creating greater revenues for the state, that's reflected in that goal. Um, so you can see the benefit in that goal, but you may see decline in others because of it, or vice versa. Um, do you have plans in the future for sort of the local site level data to feed into your annual country level analysis and your global analysis? Or is it sort of separate because that's one data set, global data set? And then there will be new data sets that come into the game. Um, there's no question about it because certainly in certain goals like tourism, um, we're really cognizant that we're missing a couple of data sets we really would like to have. Uh, they just don't exist right now. So when they come into existence, we'll bring them in. But if, in terms of building from the bottom up with scores, uh, no, because what, what we have, unless those scores are feeding into the global scores, you know, uh, we need that globally in order to keep apples compared to apples. Mm -hmm. It has to all be global, uh, and it can't quite filter up that way. But if that data is filtering up into a global database, then it can, you know, so it, it, it's sort of. <laughs> The, the different scales that you apply those kind of index earned will help you answer different questions. And so if you look at the global and the, the national scores, that will give you an idea of how countries do relative to each other. But it might not be a useful for site level management. On the other hand, if you do a, a site specific one, that might be very useful for uh, guiding uh, practices at the site level. But it's not going to be useful in terms of determining how the country where that site is located is doing Right. So it's, it's really answering well, different questions. Well, sort of the site level tool that, so if, if Rare were to download that tool and sort of use it at our sites, would that analysis then be available publicly? Or is it something it's that... It's your call. Okay, um, but we could share that then. We could, yeah. absolutely. And in fact, we would love to share it. And would share it on the website um, happily. Some people don't want to. I mean, some people go... Not really ready. We're not really ready to share this with other people, but uh, for the most part, we'd really love to. So, and and love to, you know. I, I think a pivotal piece of this is is that it's not our tool. It, it's a tool that's now available, and to make it into what people want to do uh, with it, you know, that it's available and use it, um, so that you could, you know, come up with a plan that is completely your use of this particular thing in terms of saying let, let's do it three or four places for this purpose and see if we can in fact track something that we're trying to track. Because um, the real invitation is for us, it's not ours. It's it's now, as soon as it's published, it's now everyone's. Mm -hmm. It's the whole. How, how do you monitor the, uh, I guess, the data accuracy or if you have, as you said, there's two different groups that may look at something differently and be able to... It's going to get on. ironed out in the future. Um, as we create this tool, there is going to have to be certain criteria for what kind of data you put in uh, and where that comes from. But we also want to make it really flexible because what you want is you want that that data best helps you make good decisions and that you can use it for that purpose. So, you know, I, I have done a fair amount of work at Chesapeake Bay, and if I were thinking about the Chesapeake Bay, there would be certain criteria for what, what's valid data to put in.
but I might want to change a number of things that I, I say, I don't want to measure water quality by this measurement. I want to measure water quality by this measurement because I have much better measurements of it and it's much more accurate and, and it tells me more of what I need to know. And so I'm going to put it in. That, that's what we do want to have happen. Um, the, only, the only problematic part is if you're putting data in that really throws the definition off or is just not in keeping with what that is about, then, then our people would say, we highly recommend you don't do that and we wouldn't share information that we thought was based on, on leaked data. So. Mm, I, I was wondering if the, the formula, the English was linked somehow to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessments when they said that well, 60% of the ecosystem, 16 from 24, were degraded. I don't know if there's any linkage to that. If you, if you look at the selection of the 10 um, goals, uh, they map quite right. well over the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Uh, obviously, the, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was not, not necessarily kind of a comprehensive methodology applied globally, but rather uh, a, a study that drew on a number of different studies from different sites and so on. Um, and so, in that regard, the, the data in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was not necessarily applicable to comparable global analysis. Um, but in terms of guiding what ecosystem services are important for people uh, that come from the oceans, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was, was very useful. And one of the, the guiding um, documents in terms of selecting the 10 public goals uh, for the oceans. Okay, so, not, not as much of the trends and impacts. Not as much on that side uh, was useful. No, More in the structure of the yeah, ecosystem. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would say so. Because uh, if I recall correctly, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessments um, do run some global data sets. So, in terms of, for example, habitat coverage, there's probably some updated data sets compared to the ones that we used in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that would be relevant. But in terms of site level data on specific evaluations and so on, they probably weren't relevant for. Can you just tell us a little bit about, you brought a whole set of scientists together, they made a set of decisions. How did you decide who came to the table and how did you decide how they were going to work together? Because that's never easy and you somehow pulled it off. So I'm curious, I have been that far. I don't know, do you want to comment on that? Or well, it, it wasn't that? easy as you might have anticipated. Um, actually a, a guy named Steve Katona, who you may be familiar with, uh, was handed the first task, which was go out there and find out if this already exists and if, so we don't repeat the work. In doing that, uh, one of the people he came across was Ben Halpern's piece of work that he did on the impact of humans on the ocean, which seemed relevant. Um, he then, Ben and Steve started talking together about how to create this, but simultaneously Ben was working on yet another panel that was being um, sponsored by a, a group, a working group, and they were working on very much the same thing, so we brought the two together, and actually it shifted a lot right then. Everyone had to be very flexible in terms of meeting together and pulling that together, but that's how all of these disparate people kind of came into one family, was our search plan, their workshop that was already going on, and then we just sort of took the whole thing and said, okay, we can make this work as a single thing. And yes, it was tricky. But yeah. Steve, Steve's particularly good at being able to bring disparate groups together. So it's a lot because of him. I think. And we created some strong incentives by um, securing the funding necessary to do yes. the work. <laughs> uh, and I'm yeah, sure that, that was a contributing <laughs> factor to people working together. And then I think some people saw it as an opportunity of putting their data sets of work in a global context and giving it a higher profile. Um, and so, for example, Scripps contributed with a number of data layers, uh, international geophysical and biophysical project that's affiliated with the Royal Academy of Sciences in Sweden, contributed with some of the climate change layers and so on, because they saw it as a, as a vehicle for getting more attention to their work. So can you give a little more insight into the scope of the whole project? How long has you been working on it? So the, first, the first feasibility study was undertaken. I believe in uh, 2008, it was funded by the Oak Foundation, and it was basically, uh, actually it was funded by the Oak Foundation, National Geographic, Union Aquarium, CI, who all contributed towards it. Um, and then uh, we kind of came up with a 
mission concept that was going to have a, you know, a couple dozen of, of indicators. Um, and then, uh, then the work uh, through the ANSI's work group. And ANSI is a National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis at UC Santa Barbara, where Van Halpern is leading it. And their whole purpose is to bring scientists together to do collaborations. Um, and so they've done it on a number of different topics and kind of have worked out the model on how to do it. Um, and then we secured, I think, a, a founding gift of uh, $3 million. Um, and then we raised another 5 or $6 million probably. Top of that, so we're getting up to about nine or ten million. There's probably about 65 scientists involved, and then um, uh, Deb and her crack team. Uh, we're spending money as fast as we possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> but in overall, that's probably, I to fair to say, 100 plus people involved in this effort, so it's a pretty, pretty massive undertaking. Curious, um, so each of the ten goals are given a, a score or measured as a score. So how how exactly are like the tourism and recreation sense of place measured or, or scored? Each one of them has a, a different set of um, databases that go into them. Uh, and so for instance, tourism is much more about how many people visit, how many days they spend there. Uh, it's not economic because the economic shows up in livelihoods and revenues. It's how many how many people visit. Um, sense of place is how many special places that we have designated as special places, whether it's through um, uh, heritage sites or through various, we chose various forms of recognition of a special place and what you would define a special place. And then it also has, in that same goal, it has iconic species. So what you would consider specific, specific iconic species and brought those together. So they're, they're quite different. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that the, the ten goals are all weighted equally on the surface, we immediately go, no, that's not right. When we ran some studies and, and tried different weightings, we really found out that they sort of proportionally stayed the same. They really didn't shift that much when we didn't change the weightings. Um, and, but we do think it's appropriate if, if there are people who are really concerned about seafood provision, as we should all be probably, and less concerned about iconic species. That you, you can play with it and weight it. So the next version of the website that we want is that you can actually go in there and if you want to play with the weighting, you can. We chose not to weight it since, since it didn't seem to make a big difference. But um, people should be able to do that and it's perfectly appropriate. That's what I mean when I say that the tool, it's meant to be used as a tool. It's meant to be really used so that people can get what they need out of it. Uh, not to be something that you have to uniformly fit within. But we do want to have it have certain standards for certain measurements, e.g. the global, so that when you're comparing one country to another, you're comparing it in an equal way. Um, but when you get down to a bay level or you get down to specific, it should be what you need to measure and what you, how you need to address it. And what it should give you is a sense of trade-offs. You know, if I do X, it'll cause Y. Um, that, that is the purpose for it. When you develop something that is this role, you leave a lot of pieces on the table that you wanted when you started. Was there a specific missing database that just frustrated the daylights out of you and you can't understand why no one has collected data on a broad enough scale that you could add X? Or is there an 11th or 12th measure you, you guess that some people will add to it in the near future because you couldn't quite get it? for this kickoff, but there's enough energy behind those things that you see that are likely to get added. I'm just trying to understand the dynamics because yeah. I know they're there, but I don't know I think what's the, where. The best example is probably tourism and recreation. I was going to say, though, I would say that there's a list. I would say that there's probably a good 10 or 15 of those. And that I'm hoping that one of the outcomes of this is that when we publish the paper that says, look, here, here are pieces that are missing we really need, that it would be one of the driving forces for getting them done. Um, but yeah, there are there are clear ones where you go, damn, if we had this, this would be a much stronger number, or you know, we're gonna we're gonna leave this as an open column because we know it belongs in there but we don't have it. Or that Ben's used a proxy and it's not as good a proxy as he would have liked to have had and wishes he had the real data. Um, but there's I would guess at least ten or fifteen that are really 
first priority need to be filled in, and this will be a lot stronger when we have those. And yeah. it's probably fair to say that a lot of those have to do with global data constraints. But there isn't global data yeah. so There might be right. things that are measured in 50 different ways, and then you can't do a, a comparison. Um, uh, but obviously, that would be less of a constraint when you apply it at a specific site, because the model is flexible enough for it to actually incorporate different types of data. So, for example, sense of place at the global level is using iconic species and certain levels of protection. It, when you apply it in a, in a country, say Fiji, that might be that you know a census among uh, communities and experts in terms of what's uh, considered to be important. Sense of place might actually be a more accurate and relevant measure for that country, and then you can feed that information up instead of using the, the global data. So, now if we can flip tables on you a little bit, if you don't mind, um, the reason we kind of came with myriads of people today was we would love to hear, hear and talk with you about um, opportunities and places you think that it might work, might not work, why. Just a really open conversation in terms of I see the applicability or I don't see the applicability, um, and ways potentially that we, you know, we might find ways and avenues to work together, um, or for you to work on your own with it. <laughs> Doesn't you don't have to work with us. <laughs> so. Well, just to start the conversation, as you know, you know, Rare works on the human behavior piece of this whole puzzle, um, so. One of the reasons that we have a real interest in the index is because you had the audacity to uh, not just deal with how many parts per million of X, but you dealt with a lot of human dimensions, which makes it a whole bunch more interesting for us. And because we, often in partnership with, with, with CI, work in small communities trying to impact both the value to the humans and to conservation, which also have a human interest too, but uh, we're really looking for better ways to measure are we make, having the kind of impact that we would like to have on both the human dimension and the conservation dimensions. And so, um, the incredible work that's brought all of this together has some real potential for us to use as um, baselines and measures of progress and um, other ways of measuring the work we're already even doing. Um, so I think that's why we're interested and we're particularly interested in the tool that you're working to bring it to a local community so that we can work collaboratively to, uh, to see if one method in one community is more beneficial to the overall set of measures than, than another because that would help us determine not only strategies but site selection because None of us have, have infinite resources. Well, one, one thing that we haven't touched on, but perhaps whether two can be useful in that regard, um, uh, is um, uh, explaining differences in perceptions <coughs> within the community or among communities. Uh, because if you look at the different goals uh, in a, any particular place, some of them might score high and others might score, score low. And depending on what's important for individual people, right. they might say, Ocean Zero are doing fine because you know, uh, carbon storage has got a high score. That's what I care about. Uh, while someone who does uh, fishery say Ocean Zero suck because uh, food provision score is really low. And so it provides a way of actually quantifying that and, and both explaining it uh, for your purposes, but also perhaps between different stakeholder groups and, and, and reconciling very different perspectives of, of uh, ocean health. And of course, you can track it over time. You know, hopefully, you'll see corresponding uh, changes in behavior as people see improvements or less, less positive if they see declines. Has anybody looked at the question as to whether you could take the current score that you're about to announce in 
is there any data sets that will allow us to go backwards as well as forwards? Um, that's a, a question that keeps uh, coming up. It's actually within within the, the formula, uh, it builds in um, trend data in terms of looking at the current trend. Um, and so the length of that trend varies between the different goals. And I think it's fair to say that it would require quite a bit of work to actually do hind pass all of them so you get a comprehensive uh, uh, value going back. I think in, in terms of uh, trends of the, the overall value, it's probably going to be more useful and valuable and realistic to track it forward as we continue with uh, doing this on a basis. The, the, that's uh, a, that's a do you have training to use the tool itself? Or? Yeah, in fact, one of the pieces that, that opened up is, as I was thinking about this group and what's going on is there's a number of steps that have to be taken to create the tool. One step is a workshop, which is we want to bring in a few key groups uh, and people from countries, um, policy makers, and talk about what this tool has to do and how to create it and how to use it. And um, I think we would want to invite um, any group like yourself who really says, yes, I have a program or two that I have in mind that we want to work it on. If I come into the workshop, I'll work on those. And if we come out of it with a good tool, I'll go and try and we'll, we'll create an experiment out of it. Um, those would be the best partners to be working with, people who have real ideas in mind who want to do something. And consequently, the input they give is very pointed because they know exactly what they're trying to do. And then the next step is to go and do that and then report back to the group and say, here's what it's looking like. Is it going to meet the needs? And then finalize it. And then when that tool is finished, to provide the training that's necessary to use it. But hopefully, you know, we'll have two or three groups like yourself who are saying, we're, we're going to take it out in the field and, and start working it. <laughs> you know, and see if now that we've got a tool, it really works. Um, and help us track it that way and improve it as well as it goes along. So it's, a, it's an invitation to join the party, uh, especially if you have some specific things in mind that you'd like to, to see it work on, on down the road. Um, it, would be a, it would be a terrific opportunity to be in from the get-go and make sure it works the way you want it to work. I don't know how much media outreach you do in different countries where you work, but obviously when, when this is launched, um, where it's an opportunity of, of uh, commenting on it from Rare, Rare's perspective or Rare, Rare's perspective in any country, kind of hits your communications wagon to something that we're hoping is going to get a lot of traction and coverage. So those are sort of two big roads, I think, that you know, if, if you guys like it and think it makes sense and talk about it, um, it would make the most sense for, for working together going forward. Um, so I mentioned that I work in program development, and that's creating and launching new programs rather than fundraising for them. Um, <laughs> and I work with a team of folks from all of our different regional offices who are in charge of finding new partners to work with. As you know, we have a partnership-based model. So I think it would be an interesting tool for us to look at both in terms of our own site selection, like which partners are we working with, which sites the partners are working at within country, um, are we sort of accepting into the PRIDE program. But then I think it's also a really interesting tool for us to potentially teach our partners to use so that they can continue to track their own um, projects and sites in the long term. Um, so I see it sort of two ways from uh, Rare's perspective, both for our own assessment purposes, but then also as sort of a tool that we can then pass on to all of our partners. So. That, that would be ideal. And, and I would say short term as well, if you can, if you can model the activities you're going to do on certain protected area with surfs and stuff, if that gives you that you can really show to other donors, okay, this is what this very reliable tool is showing us, and this is what it's going to look like in three or four years from now. Mm -hmm. And that, that visual, at least if it's in some numbers, is very powerful for some donors. They're going to say, okay, this is a reliable tool, you have your data, we teach the conservation fellow to gather this information. Yeah, it gives you an objective measurement tool to, to present to your donors and say, right. and then you, we three we years in advance, four or five years, contrast that, that yeah. information. And that's what we'll help you so you can really... Then you better really work with us on the tool. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Which was the sort of general timeline in terms of school development? Six months. Um, from we're, what we're, day? From now. We're, we're aiming to put the workshop together first. I don't have an exact date for it yet. Um, this is kind of part of the process, mm -hmm. is to talk to a few key groups who we think could be really good partners in this and um, see if it makes sense and pull the workshop together and then that will kick off the go forward date. But the person who's going to do it starts in June, so he'll hands on be the one managing it. Cool. Thank Should we leave much. it in your hands for next steps and you kind of... Yeah, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time and if anybody would like to join us just to talk about how we'll where might work with uh, the Ocean Health Index and so forth. And uh, um, I'm kind of representing on the L. Wanted to be here but couldn't, but very, wants, very much wants to be a part of, of, uh, of that workshop and so forth. So um, if anybody else would like to stay and, and be involved in that discussion, fine. And if you can't stay but would like to know more about it, just let me know and I'll keep you in the loop. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.